Push back from the table, listen to his words, his secret plan before we have to go. It's not complicated, don't need a lot of rules. This is all you need to know. Well, hello, Synergy 2.0. Welcome to worship tonight. Synergy means working together to accomplish something greater than we could do alone. And that's what we do here every Wednesday night at 6 o'clock as we worship. Whether you're here in the sanctuary worshiping with us or joining us on Facebook Live, we are so glad to have you with us. If you are joining us online, please drop a hello in the comments and let us know that you're with us. If you're here in the sanctuary, please take an opportunity to sign the connection pads that are in the pews and uh, let us know that you worshiped with us that way. Uh, synergy is meant to be a little less formal, uh, a blend of more contemporary music or blend of musical styles without some of the traditional elements of Sunday morning church. Uh, one difference is the offering we take. We have baskets at the back of the sanctuary. Uh, if you want to make an offering, you can just drop it there in the offering plate. Uh, otherwise, it can always be brought into the church office, mailed to the church office, or we have a giving button on our website. And we thank you so much for your support of the mission and ministry at FPC. Uh, just one announcement tonight. We have Advent small groups uh, beginning here in a couple of weeks. Those, we have some groups meeting here at the church. We have some other groups meeting out in the community. Uh, if you are interested in getting involved, please call the church office. Uh, we can give you a rundown of when those groups are meeting, where those groups are meeting, and see if we can't find you a group to get plugged into. This year's uh, uh, theme is the Advent Conspiracy. So we'll, we'll be reading the book, The Advent Conspiracy, watching some videos, and learning how we can make Christmas meaningful again. Well, here at FPC, we don't have all the answers when it comes to life and faith. What we do have is a desire to build relationships, to seek answers together, 
to support one another on the journey of faith. We believe church isn't about rules and regulations. It's about relationships. It's about loving God and our neighbors as much as ourselves. This is a place to be who God created you to be. So no matter who you are, where you come from, what you've done, who you love, there's a place for you here at FPC, and we'd love to make you feel welcome. Well, church, let's worship together. One, two, one, two, three, four. But Jesus is the river of love, and it flows from heaven above. And everything you have to wash us away. You just jump in the water today. You go down and you learn to pray. Well, my Jesus is a river of love, and He's flowing your way. There's a river flowing out of heaven, see. Jump on the water's fine and it will set you free. My Jesus is a river of love and it flows from heaven above. And it takes everything you have to walk the way. You just jump in the water today. You don't drown and you learn to pray. My Jesus is a river of love and it flows from heaven If you need a cleansing, children, don't delay. Jump on in, what is fine?
believe in somebody testify. You believe it. You receive it. You believe it. Somebody testify. pray together. God, we would be lost without you in our lives, without your guidance and direction. Thank you for dealing with us so graciously, for loving us when we feel unlovable, for welcoming us when it seems like uh, maybe there's no room left in your presence or at your table. Like Rahab, we often find ourselves on the outside looking in even in our own community. Forgive us when we seek to hold others at arm's length. when We fail to provide radical hospitality and and welcome all your people. Lord, in worship tonight, block out the voices of this world that promote fear and hostility toward those who don't think or look or act like us. Instead, open our hearts to the movement of your Holy Spirit so that we can love you and our neighbors as much as ourselves. Amen. Let's start with a question tonight. Have you ever wondered what your life would be like if you had made one or two different decisions along the way? Oh, yeah. Anybody ever wonder that? I hope I'm not the only one who wakes up at 2 o'clock in the morning with those thoughts on my mind. Think about it for a second. I'll use myself as an example. What if I had never gone to seminary? I wouldn't have met Kim. Isaac, Hannah, and Micah wouldn't be here in the world. Somebody else would be standing up here leading worship tonight. Or maybe we wouldn't be worshiping at all tonight. Not just my world, but the world in general would be changed. It would be different. It's like dropping a stone into a pool of water. Our actions can have ripple effects on the rest of our lives and even on the world around us. And You can't predict what those effects are going to be. One or two different decisions can change the world, can change your world. Sometimes the enormity of it all feels almost paralyzing. That's why faith matters so much. That's why we talk about faith so much in the church. When we're faced with difficult decisions, difficult choices, it's faith that enables us to move forward. I think that's the message we find in Hebrews chapter 11 tonight, what we're going to look at. The author of Hebrews was writing to a persecuted community. It was a community of Jewish converts to the Christian faith. He was encouraging them not to give up, to persevere, to keep going, even though they were being abused and marginalized by the community around them. And he does it by reminding them of all these Old Testament heroes of the faith, people who endured and kept going in the face of hardship. And I think that's what faith is for the author of Hebrews. It's moving forward even when you can't see where you're going, even when you don't know what's coming. 
It's the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Faith is saying, God, I'll do what you ask me to do even though I don't know what the outcome will be because I trust you to be good to your word. Before we go any farther, band, would you help us prepare our hearts tonight? Survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count for loss and for contempt. So the author of Hebrews 11 talks about all of these Old Testament heroes. And all of them had two things in common. One, they trusted God and lived by faith. And two, their lives were not perfect. They were all broken and sinful people just like us. But God used them anyway. 
And I think we see that big time in today's unlikely hero, a woman named Rahab. So here's what the author of Hebrews says about Rahab in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 30 and 31. It says, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute. Now, let that sink in for just a minute. What does it say about God that a prostitute is considered a hero of our faith? There is a beautiful story of grace, love, and redemption hiding in this larger narrative. And I don't want us to miss it. So by faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. Now what is she talking, or what is the author talking about? Well, if we go back into the Old Testament... Uh, to Joshua chapter 2, we find the whole story, the rest of the story. The Israelites had been slaves in Egypt, but through Moses, uh, God frees his people from Pharaoh's oppression. Moses leads them through the Red Sea to to the promised land. Then Moses dies, and a new leader, Joshua, is raised up for them. But Joshua faces a problem. God's promised land belongs to somebody else, the Canaanites. And Canaan is basically made up of a bunch of fortified city-states. The strongest one is a place called Jericho. Jericho uh, is also the first one that the Israelites are going to have to take down in order to conquer the promised land. The Israelites aren't even an army. They're hardly even a nation. So to do it's going to take a lot of faith. The story begins this way. Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. Then Joshua, son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. So Joshua wants to gather some intelligence. He wants to know what they're up against. He's a good leader. So he sends these two spies to check out the city of Jericho. Now, when when we think of Jericho, what do we usually think of? The walls, right? Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, that old spiritual. Well, there were actually two walls at Jericho. There was an inner wall that was like 20 feet high, made out of huge blocks. And then there was a smaller wall, a little ways out from that, that was 10 to 12 feet high, made of bricks. So uh, what this means is that if you lived in Jericho, you slept pretty well at night. There wasn't much that was going to get through those walls. But Jericho was also a pagan city. It's pretty nasty stuff happened there, which is why God ordered the Israelites to conquer it. Verse 1 continues, The spies went and entered the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab, and they spent the night there. I don't know about you, but this raises a big question in my mind. Why would two good Hebrew boys go into the house of a prostitute? It's not what some of you might be thinking. I think it's because strange men went in and out of this house all the time. All day, every day. What better place for two spies to lay low, so to speak? Well, the king finds out uh, somehow and sends his men to Rahab's house, but instead of giving these men up, she hides them on the roof and sends the king's men on a wild goose chase, which raises another question. Why would this Canaanite woman, this prostitute, protect the Israelite spies? These outsiders who are coming to destroy her home and her people. Well, think about who Rahab is. As a prostitute, Rahab is also an outsider. In Rahab's day, you weren't a prostitute by choice. 
In some cultures, if a family owed a debt, they often had to sell a daughter to pay it off. Well, whatever drove her to that profession, Rahab was the victim of a system where women had no opportunity. Slavery or prostitution may have been the only option she had for survival. While some might condemn her lifestyle, I think it's easy to find sympathy for her, to understand why she had no allegiance to her community and why she went to the risk of hiding those spies. If you've ever found yourself on the outside looking in, this story is for you. Once the king's men leave, Rahab goes to the roof and says to the spies, I know that the Lord has given you our land and that dread of you has fallen on us, that all of the inhabitants of our land melt in fear before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you utterly de destroyed. As soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. There was no courage left in any of us because of you. Some good intelligence these guys are picking up, right? The Lord your God is indeed God in heaven above and on earth below. That last sentence is important. The Lord your God is indeed God in heaven above and on earth below. We don't know when or how, but at some point, God tugged at Rahab's heart. This Canaanite prostitute has basically just offered a confession of faith to Israel's God. Now we know why she hid those spies. She's heard the stories and has come to believe. Her heart has been changed and she's willing to go to that risk, which is exactly what God calls us to do. God knows our faith won't be perfect. God doesn't care about which side of the track we grew up on. God doesn't care about our race or our gender or our sexuality. There is no wrong kind of person with God. Nothing disqualifies you from God's love. Then Rahab takes a bold leap. Look at verse 12. Now, since I have dealt kindly with you, she says to the spies, swear to me by the Lord that you in turn will deal kindly with my family. Give me a sign of good faith that you will spare my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. Now, Rahab is no dummy. She didn't go to the risk of hiding the spies without wanting something for herself and her family in return. She's a shrewd businesswoman. She's bargaining for her life and for the lives of her family. The key word in these verses is a Hebrew word. It's the word chesed. Chesed. Now say it. You have to get like you've got a big old goober in your throat. Chesed. Chesed. <coughs> Excuse me. It means faithfulness. Faithfulness. The kind of faithfulness you would expect in a covenant relationship. The kind of faithfulness God showed to God's people Israel. So basically, Rahab is saying, I expect Israel, I expect you to act with the same faithfulness that God showed you. Well, the spies agree whether they could sign the covenant or not. The covenant seal. And with that, Rahab lowers the men down by a rope, gives them instructions on how to get back to their people, and they reply in verse 17, We will be released from this oath that you have made us swear to you if we invade the land, and you do not tie this crimson cord in the window through which you let us down. You do not gather your family, uh, your, your house, your father and mother, your brothers, and all your family. 
If any of you go out of the doors of your house into the street, they'll be responsible for their own death and will be innocent. But if a hand is laid on any of them who are in the house, we will bear the responsibility for their death. But if you tell this business of ours, then we will be released from this oath that you made us swear to you. And Rahab says, so be it. And she sends them away and they leave. And she ties this crimson cord in the window. Now, What do we call the part of a city where not so nice things happen? It's a district. The red light district, right? And, and what was that great book about uh, uh, adultery, the, the big letter A, the scarlet letter? Now, I know about you guys. So crimson, red, scarlet, they have always been seen as standing for sin or mistakes. And this is pretty cool. This crimson cord is really pretty significant. There is a scarlet thread that weaves its way from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation and beyond. In the Old Testament, it's the blood of a lamb sprinkled on the doorpost of a home before Passover. The New Testament, it's the blood of Jesus shed for us on the cross as a sign of our salvation. I love the last words that Rahab speaks to the spies. She says, so be it, so be it. Now, in English, that is three words, right? So be it, right. In Hebrew, it's one word. Anybody know what it is? Am I the only Hebrew scholar in the room? I'm not so scholarly anymore, never mind. It is the word amen, amen. So these three have just shared a holy moment And guess who gets to pronounce the blessing? This Canaanite prostitute. Because she had the faith to take a risk and say yes to God. But she actually gets to do even more than that. Because the walls of Jericho fall, and Joshua chapter 6, verse 25 says, But Rahab the prostitute, with her family and all who belonged to her, Joshua spared. Her family has lived in Israel ever since, for she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Now, there is a detail here that is often missed in the story of Rahab, but you have to go to the New Testament in the book of Matthew to find it. It's found in Matthew chapter 1. There is a genealogy there, and part of that genealogy goes like this. And Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. And at the end of the genealogy, in verse 16, it says, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, who bore Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Church, there's a prostitute in the family tree. What message does that share? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're young or old, rich or poor, wise or foolish, gay, straight, trans, or you just don't know. If you think God can't or won't do great things through you or for you, that God doesn't love you because of your past or your present, because of who you are or what you've done or who you love. Look at Rahab. A prostitute became a hero of our faith. The world kept her out, but God drew her in. And God said to her, I want you to be the great, 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 great grandma of my son. He 
Because that's what God does. When we have the faith to take risks and say yes to God, we experience everything that is possible with God. And God does great things through us. But we have to be willing to walk by faith. Amen. Let's pray together. God of glory, we behold your creation with wonder. We grow and are nurtured by your love. As a stream carves a path through rock, your spirit guides us through the rough patches of life. There is so much we don't understand, O oh God. So many questions for which we seek answers. We thank you for your presence, for even allowing us to ask or seek or knock at your door. Grant us your wisdom and your grace right now, Lord. We pray for those in war-torn lands where violence and conflict are a part of daily life. Redeem and restore the lives of the innocent. We pray for the women of Iran as they seek their, uh, as they risk their lives to protest an unjust system of patriarchy, power, and a purity code no one could follow. Protect these women who have had enough of oppression, who boldly question the unquestioned regime, who risk imprisonment for the sake of freedom. Steadfast God, you sent your Son to live among us, to suffer as we suffer. We know you hear our prayers for the sick, for the grieving, for the lonely, for the tired, for the overwhelmed and the frantic. You know the plight of the poor, the unhoused, the hungry, the marginalized. You are there for the dying, the despairing, and the desperate. Help us, O oh God, to be there too. To be your hands and feet, to be your witnesses and bearers of your good news. Lord, hear these prayers that we lift up along with the joys and concerns known only in our hearts as we join together in the prayer that your son gave us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, church, thank you for joining us tonight at Synergy. We hope to see you next week right back here at 6 o'clock. And with that, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. There's revival and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song. Once you choose it, you'll never lose it. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing I've seen my joy. I got an old church crying, singing in my soul. I got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I got a heart overflowing because it's been restored. There ain't nothing going to steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing going to steal my joy. When the valleys that I wander turn to mountains that I can't climb, oh, you're with me.
Get home safe.